they discuss a lot of different algorithms, and I want to build up to the bidirectional path tracing by doing a summary of the sorts we've done so far. Um, we can compute the intensity of the pixel by you know, starting out at the pixel on this thing, choose a subsample location, consider the effect of a point on the lens and where that ray is going to go from that point on the lens into the scene, bounce it off of surfaces, and each time we bounce we can consider both the direct illumination and the indirect illumination all together by just bouncing around until we hit a light source. Okay, say so we bounce off this wall and hit a ray and it finally hits the light on the ceiling. And that's very noisy because this ray might miss the light if we choose a random direction. So another improvement we made that you all did for homework is to make separate illumination on the light source. So you could get that uh, direct illumination separately with the shadow rays. But that doesn't give caustics. So for the caustics, we start out from the light source and we aim toward, say, any kind of refracting surface like this globe that maybe refracts a ray and that's going to create some sort of a, on this floor here, it's going to create a bright spot on the floor where the light is refracting. And we'll save that in a caustic map and then later when we have our ray from the eye or the lens and we shade this point on this floor, we'll try and pick up this density of photons somehow. When we study photon mapping, we'll talk more about the technique of saving the density and collecting it. Um, and that will get the caustic rays. But one thing it won't get is if you have like recessed lighting, a light bulb inside a lampshade where the light has got to bounce off of the lampshade or be transmitted diffusely through it or cove lighting where they don't want you to look at the light bulb so they put the light bulbs you know inside this region here and the light has got to bounce off the wall to get to you or maybe bounce several bounces to get to you in which case tracing a shadow feeler from some place in the room you know unless you're a fly on the ceiling or on the wall right directly above it to the light won't get those reflections and it's not a caustic either because these are diffuse surfaces it's bouncing off of. And the caustic rays are good for aiming directly at the specular surfaces, refracting or reflecting. So in that case, you could say, okay, let's just bounce the light, the rays from the light off of all the surfaces in the room and maybe it'll come into the eye or the camera lens, in which case it'll get recorded. But it's just like maybe one of these rays by luck will just happen to bounce toward the direction of that small light source. It's very unlikely that the ray from this light bulb will bounce exactly into the camera lens. So most of the rays will just, you know, Russian roulette or some depth count will stop them and they won't contribute to the image. So the, the solution to that is bidirectional ray tracing. And so here, let's, let's think of this sketch here. What we're going to do is we're going to trace rays from the eye and through the lens and whichever direction they bounce off of we're going to do them for a certain number of bounces, say two, and then we're going to trace rays from the light source, a certain number of bounces. In this case, it looks like I've got about four. And then we're going to join them by a ray that goes through the environment that wasn't determined by our choice of what direction we were going to bounce in. There's a probability distribution for each of these. But this one doesn't come from a probability. Say we're starting, let's see what the notation is. Um, 
starting, say, x0 on the light source, x1, x2, x3, where we stopped on this bounce, and here, y0 on the camera lens and pixel, y1, y2. And then we'll make an extra path from y2 to x3. And then we'll continue, and we're guaranteed to hit the light source because we started from it. So basically, we're going to look at contribution from paths that look like y0, y1, y2 up to yk, I guess k is 3 in this place, and then continue to xl, xl minus 1, x1, x0. So that uh, path starts at your i and eventually does hit a light source. But we have to have the weight for that contribution. And so that weight is a combination of BRDS, the cosine terms, or geometry terms, however you want to think of it. Uh, I guess I'm going to think of choosing direction. So I'm going to use the, uh, just the cosine weight instead of that whole geometry term. So that means this contribution has the weight in terms, what we really want is an integral of everything the eye sees over all possible pairs of length. In this case, how many segments do I have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six segments. Um, and so the weight of that segment, we have to think what is happening to this path here. What we have is we have the B R D F, or maybe I should just call it F sub R. Um, well, I guess I'll do it in terms of, of, of geometry. Assume you're assume instead of choosing directions, you're choosing points, because that's the way it was apparently in the book. So it's gonna have uh, See, the light starts at x0. I guess it's the way it's, I copied it out of the book, it went in the opposite direction. And it's going in direction x0, x1. So this is the unit direction vector. And this is the light source emissivity, which could depend on where on the light you were and what direction. You know, some light sources, like ones that have certain shapes of lampshades or reflectors, emit differently in different directions. So this is just you know, the flux emitted from the light source. And then we multiply it by the geometry term g x0 x1, which has those cosines and distance in them. Um, normally, we'd have a visibility x0 x1. Um, if you do it from ray tracing, though, you know that x1 is a point you're going to hit. Um, and now we're going to go from x1 to x2. So uh, what do we have? We have the bidirectional reflection function at uh, x1, and we have the vector from x1 back to x0, because that's the direction the light comes from, sort of the opposite of the, the way the ray was traced, because both of these have to start at x1, x1 to x2. That's the way it's reflected. And then we have a g of x1 to x2. Um, see how many x's did I have? I'm going to continue. So you can see, you just keep going like this. Now, as I was saying, if eventually we're going to have this whole term, in the end, it's going to be divided by the probability of the uh, path.
And I'll just write it as y0, y1, what I call it, y, k, x, l, x0. So this probability, if we're doing by ray tracing, has a bunch of, uh, you know, we're weighting the probability, say, by the cosine. And that's going to cancel the cosine in its geometry term. And then, you know, it's per, we're generating a probability per solid angle. So the rest of this geometry term is going to be canceled by the solid angle. The visibility term is going to be canceled by the fact that the ray is definitely hitting that because we chose the ray according to a direction distribution rather than taking a point on a random surface in a random position. And so a lot of these factors are going to cancel a lot of the factors here. And what you're going to be left is a bunch of these FR factors when you're actually doing it in practice. Except that the, uh, the, uh, this part, x, x3 to y2, won't be canceled. Right, because this ray was determined already by this position and that position. And the visibility from x3 to y2 won't be canceled because the ray actually may hit an object. You know, there may be a table here. And, you know, we don't get to choose this y as to where this ray hits the table because this, this, this y started coming in the other direction from the eye. So that visibility term is part of the computation. If the ray doesn't get there through that table, its, its contribution will be zero. And we're going to still get all these FRs. So this is, I guess, where this is, is x3, x3, x2 and now x3, y2. This is the direction we didn't get to choose. And then we can continue uh, for th with the y's, you know, their geometry, I guess it's going to be y2, y1, and this visibility would be canceled. This fr would stay in, and, and so forth. So, um, It's, it's the terms near the center that's, that, that don't get canceled. You could also choose it, say you were doing glossy reflection. Instead of choosing it by, uh, by the uh, cosine weight, you could choose it by the Fong distribution. Right? In which case, you'd be canceling the Fong by parts of this. But since you don't get to choose this one, this is coming from the bidirectional reflection function. I mean, this is coming because the path went from the other direction. That wouldn't be canceled. So somewhere near the middle, you get terms which aren't canceled. And what this is estimating then is it's contributing to a sum, basically, over all choices. Say you have n choices, and we have the sum of the n evaluations of the integrand uh, divided by their probability. And that's going to be our estimate of the integral over all possible choices of this bidirectional path. But it's not over all choices for k and l. right? If we had a path with, here, let me simplify this picture by taking away, uh, what did I, I already took it away, this extra ray here. So this was a ray, this was a path with one, two, three, four, five, six segments. But we could have also generated a path with six segments. Let me draw this same room here. Here's the back wall. How am I drawing it like that? Here's a, I didn't draw a front wall. I draw do a floor and a wall here. Here is our uh, camera or eye, and suppose we went uh, three paths here, and then only two paths from this light bulb. 
Right? So now K and L are different. And we get a different way of building the path of six segments. And our integral is then could be evaluated as a sum of those things instead, divided by n. And so there's a different way of estimating, and some estimates might be better than others. For example, the one that uh, requires that this path have all its segments bouncing like this, one, two, three, four, five, and only the sixth is this direct illumination path, that's going to be very noisy because only a few of these will have a, you know, luck to come up here and zip right down into that cove thing. But there may be other situations where that creates less noise. So there's this other paper by uh, Eric Veach where he says how to optimally combine the paths generated by these different ways of getting these six bounces so that the ones that have least noise in a particular effect on a you know, particular region contribute most and therefore the variance is less. Um, the other thing that you can do with bidirectional path tracing is to say, okay, suppose, let's go back to this side. Here is, uh, say, one, two, three, four, well, we could think of five going this way and another three going that way. One, two, three, and then finally joining it. There we get a path with uh, nine segments. Five from one, two, three, four, five, and then this sixth one is the extra one you got from joining the X and Y, seven, eight, nine. But once you did this ray tracing and choosing this distribution, distribution of directions, you could also, instead of joining this endpoint to that endpoint, you could join this endpoint to that endpoint, or this endpoint to that endpoint. Or you could shorten this path and join this one to this endpoint, or this one to that endpoint. In other words, you can, if you've gone to the trouble of generating these rays and seeing where they hit, the first object they hit, you can form various dotted lines and get terms like this with different numbers of segments in them. Because really what you're doing, you have to have an infinite series, right? You have the set of contributions to the integral from one bounce, or that would be direct from the light to the eye, where both are dotted. It's just one dotted line, direct viewing of the light source. Or, you know, two bounces, one bounce, two bounces. You could generate them. It's an infinite series. Of course, if your reflectivity is less than one, it's eventually contribution is going to go down, like I showed with that geometric series. So really, it's finite. But you can get the different terms of that finite series by choosing different dotted lines and amortizing the cost of the initial ray tracing to generate the longer paths. And then you combine them all. So the idea is it's just good to get some effects that you can't get by efficiently, without noise, by starting only in one direction or only in the other direction. Okay, so that's bidirectional ray tracing. Now I want to talk about radiance caching. And the idea there is if you're going to try and do any of these recursive ray tracing methods for a specific pixel, right? You're going to have to do it again for the next pixel in the image, which is going to get you a nearby ray, probably. Very likely hit the same surface. And you have to do this Monte Carlo calculation, which is a bunch of repetitions in order for this sum to have low variance, right? You've discovered in your homework how long it is to get rid of the noise. And if you have to do this again and again for adjacent points, you're sort of wasting the effort because very likely this point has a shading similar to that point. And maybe you could just extrapolate or interpolate. In other words, do like a low resolution image where you have a certain number of rays that you took the whole, the whole trouble to do it. And then just try and interpolate or extrapolate between them. And, the, and that's the radiance caching scheme. But suppose you have a red book on the floor, right? 
Well, you know, both all these rays hit the you know gray rug, but this one had had the red book. Obviously, you're going to get the wrong color by trying to interpolate. What you really care about is how much light is irradiating, the irradiance, how much light is coming in from the environment. That final multiplication by the diffuse reflectivity, if it's constant, say, for a diffuse surface as you pull it out the integral, that's the only thing that changes. And similarly on a textured book cover that has a title and a, you know, a photograph on the cover or something. Basically, the amount of light that's hitting it is varying. It's only the reflectivity that's it's varying slowly. It's only the reflectivity that's varying quickly. So instead of caching the radiance, Cache the irradiance, how much light you are gathering in from all those other directions. And so that's Greg Ward's, he's the first author on most of the papers, so I call it his irradiance caching. And basically it says do uh, Monte Carlo I guess this should be capital. Um, what did we call it? Uh, oh, let's call it gathering. It's really distributed ray tracing or path tracing. Path tracing. Computation. That, and, and do it well with lots of rays instead of at every pixel, every surface point, trace a few rays and get a noisy image because the variance wasn't low. I want to do with many rays and low variance. That means an accurate answer. You're going to spend your rays by doing it over fewer points. and interpolate between them when you're doing the, the final rendering. Or you can think of it as an incremental rendering where you just shoot more rays and each time you shoot a ray onto a surface, where did I have a picture of those samples? Yeah, I had a picture of the samples here. You decide how close you need to be you know, you're going to, this is like the photon mapping, you're sort of going to gather the samples nearby and take a weighted average of them, which is this interpolation. And if there are not enough samples nearby, you can generate a new one here and add it to the list. So basically we're going to store the cached irradiance in uh, 3D octree. And this is the same idea that's used in photon mapping. And the reason is that we don't want to store it on polygon surfaces, otherwise, you know, we'd have to say, well, this book is a different polygon, so we're not finding any samples on it. Right? This book, this book even might be a little bit above, you know, if we hit the top cover of the book, it's a little bit above the ground. It's not on this plane even. But nevertheless, the irradiance here is pretty close to it. You know, whatever hits here probably hits the book. Actually, that's not strictly true. Um, suppose you have a light source here, and the book is here, sticking a little bit of the ground, and you're trying to shade this point on the ground. Well, this point on the ground is shadowed by the book. So the irradiance isn't the same. Actually, if we take, say, we take a block here. This point, even though it's not shadowed, doesn't have the same irradiance as this point because the normal vector is very different. So that cosine theta, <coughs> here theta is very big and here, you know, theta is very small, just about zero. So in that case, the irradiance here is not a good estimate for the irradiance here because the surface normals are very different. 
So what you want to do is find some way of evaluating the error of the different points that are cached in terms of how far they are in distance and how far they are with respect to the normal change. And only include ones whose errors are small enough below a threshold and even for those weight them inversely as the error. So that means for rendering Um, so th let me take away that sentence. Let me save, say what you save. Saving the position, say PI, the normal NI for that I sample, and the irradiance EI. And then for sh let me put it on the next board for shading. Uh, the gather from the oak tree nearby uh, irradiance samples. And for shading points A, point P. Um, I will take the uh, irradiance at P that we're going to use in the Lambert law multiplied by the diffuse color of the specific object, whether it's the book or floor or whatever, and the cosine uh, is already in the irradiance, I guess, if the normals are close enough. Um, and it's going to be the sum of weights I... Uh, EI, EI is e, e, say at that point PI that was saved over the sum of the weights. Where the weight in the sum is 1 over the error of the I sample of P. So basically, the error depends on the point P and the point PI, how far away they are, the normal and the normal at I, how far away they are. And there's a formula that I, in the book that I want to describe the derivation of, because it's not in the book. I went back to the paper. So it's the distance between P and PI divided by R I um, plus the square root of 1 minus NP, what did I call it? I just called it N, right? At, no, I didn't. The normal at the point P dot the normal at the point PI, NI. So this says this dot product will be close to 1 uh, if the normals are close, so this square root will be small. And if the points are close, this will be close. But how do you compare the point, point closeness to? It's close to basically the distance of the samples that were used in the gathering to create this irradiance cached value. So, uh, so it's basically it's the harmonic mean Ri of the sample. Uh, next surface. Right, so when we compute, if I go back to this board, for each of these cached values, we're going to go and, and have a bunch of rays that are going to hit a bunch of things. One ray may hit this table if the table is sitting above here. Or it may go all the way to the ceiling. So we want the average value. Because if, if uh, here is the, the ground and the light source is up here somewhere and we have something that's fairly close to the ground, let me draw it even closer, 
then as you move along the ground, the amount of distance you have to move in order to get out of the shadow is going to be much less than if this potential blocker from the light source was much farther away. So you want to know the average distance and, and basically it's the ratio of the amount you move from P to PI to this average distance RI. But if you just took the average distance and most things were far away and you just had one that was really close, the average distance would still be far away and you wouldn't have this effect. So instead, they use the harmonic mean. The harmonic mean is if we have samples, um, when, when you get this i's cached point, we have a bunch of distances. What we do is we say 1 over this r for the harmonic mean is the mean where n is the number of samples now that you use to get the irradiance at this i point here. Of, uh, so maybe I'll use subset of j, the sum of 1 over the distance to the j sample. Really, it's the distance from this point pi to this j sample. Right? So that means you're averaging the reciprocals and then taking the reciprocal of that to find this distance, ri. And what that does is it makes things that have small distance, they have a big contribution, instead of the far away ones have the big contribution, they have more effect on the harmonic mean. Okay, so what is the meaning of these two terms? And so the way they were computed was by using a split sphere approximation. So we're not interested in approximating this uh, irradiance E, we're interested in seeing how it changes if you move the surface a little bit or if you tilt the normal a little bit. And so the worst case would be uh, if you had, here's this sphere uh, above the point, here's the normal to the point, uh, and this is the point P, and we want to, or say it's a point PI, and we want to think what happens if we move it a little bit to a point P, or if we tilt the surface a little bit, so NI changes. Um, we're going to say half of this sphere is black, and half of this sphere is maximum brightness white. And you now that's sort of the worst case you could do. And the radius of this sphere is this R, this, uh, you know, this harmonic mean of the distances of the objects, for which you're going to compare the distance of the motion from the center to this new sample point. And so what's going to happen when we look at this sphere? So when we look at this sphere, we have another sphere. I mean, basically, when you're thinking in terms of the integral, it's as if we move this whole sphere, and now this black and white region, which is really on geometry, far away from this point, isn't changing. But on the new sphere, it's as if, well, either move the sphere to the right, or you can think of moving this black region to the left by the same amount. That has the same effect. Now we can think of keeping the center fixed, but now this black has shifted over. How much brighter did it get? Well, it got brighter by the projected area of this deformed strip here, right? Which is because, remember, this, this uh, integral of the cosine is, is this projected onto the plane. We talked about it last time with that Nusselt analog. So if we think of this thing as the delta P, this is actually a little rectangle of width R here and delta P here. And so what fraction of the area of the whole sphere does it represent? It's... Uh, Delta P times R of, of this whole projected area, which was pi R squared. So one of the R's cancel. And actually, it's a two. two because this is two R this way. I wrote this wrong. 
So what it amounts to is uh, delta P over, uh, over R times some factor 2 over pi. So, you know, since it's all based on a threshold anyway, and, and actually I think I missed one or two, the two somewhere, I vaguely recall in the paper it was 4 over pi. Um, but I don't remember why at this point. Um, in any case, it's a constant factor. So that explains this, this term here. It's because of the point moving. Now what about the normals changing? So now let me erase this and draw this same sphere here with this half white and this half black with this normal. This was the normal Ni, but suppose we have another normal N, right? So that now we've basically got a different surface, and we've got a different plane here. And from the point of view of this plane, it's as if, you know, if we, if, if we pretend that instead the sphere rotated instead of the reference frame. It's as if this thing moved over to here. So now instead of getting a, pro a, a projected strip of constant width, we get a projected, uh, you know, this is the, when, when, we, when this projects vertically, I should have drawn a little longer, it projects to an elliptical region. And this, the width of this elliptical region, see if I can figure it out. Um, if this angle, alpha is cosine inverse of n dot ni, right? Because these, this angle between these two normals is the same as the angle between these two planes. And now, what do we have here? Uh, let me look at my notes, because I think I've got an extra cosine in my mind here. I have so many different sets of notes, I think I've got the wrong one. Um, on one of these, I actually... Well, I can go back to the original paper, which I, also, which I brought with me, too. But somewhere here, I think I had the geometry drawn. Uh, okay, I'm going to have to look through more closely which set of notes I brought with me. Here it is. I think it was on the one. I'm not convinced this is correct. Um, actually, this project if, if this is alpha, this distance is uh, sine alpha. Is that true? Right, because this projected from here to here is the same as from here to here. Because I should draw it a little bigger now that I've made my width bigger. Right, because this distance is the same as, as, as that distance. Right, this is projected vertically. So sine alpha is a pro sine alpha alpha is approximately equal to alpha. Um, so this area is to the whole area of this sector as. This, this is actually sine alpha, but the radius is r, not 1. So it's r sine alpha, and that's approximately r alpha. 
So it's uh, well, basically, I can think of it as here. Here is a circle of radius r, and for every line across this circle, I'm going for another line that's alpha as large. And that's the fraction of the projected area. So the fraction is really the sine alpha that I was writing here. And, and so if that's approximately alpha, if uh, n dot n i, which is cosine of alpha, we can think of that as 1 minus alpha squared over 2. And when, then we can solve this for alpha. Right? There's more terms, but the uh, second order, actually the third order too, because the next term is alpha squared to the fourth. This is an approximation, the Taylor series approximation. And so we can say alpha squared over 2 is 1 minus n dot ni. And alpha, this ra rel it's, it's, it's the relative error, right? It's the fraction of the irradiance. Whatever the irradiance is, it's that fraction that's changing. Uh, is uh, the square root of 2 times the square root of 1 minus n dot ni. And since we're going to have an error threshold, we're also not worrying about this factor, just like we didn't worry about that factor. So this term gives you the relative uh, change due to the surface tilting. And finally, we have to solve this problem. And the way to solve this problem is to say, okay, here is the ni for the sample, and here is the n here. And if we take the average, in the case of the top of this book on the floor, they're really the same. So we take ni plus n over 2, And now we dot it. Uh, let me erase these other equations. We dot it with this vector here. This is the point P that we want to shade, and this is the point PI that we have an irradiance sample for. And if this dot P minus PI is less than zero. That means it's likely, if P is behind this surface, basically, then it's got a chance of being in shadow here. So this sample is a bad one for shading it. So what we're going to do then is We're going to compute this, uh, and we're going to take for all samples. This sum is only over the samples pi, so that this formula is bigger than zero. ni plus n over 2 dot p minus pi is greater than or equal to zero. Those are the ones we're including in this sum. And that way we're going to solve the problem of missing shadows because we took bad samples. So the part I'm not talking about about the paper is how to organize the arc tree so that you can rapidly get these samples from them. Basically, the scheme is to make sure that you only need to check eight cells once because to get a given sample, to get, to get enough things to average. And if... Uh, so, and, and I should say, and epsilon i is less than a threshold, right? Because you don't want to be dividing by zero. So, I'm, so it should be greater than, let's see, what is it? One over, so the error should be less, let me think about that. The error could be, could this error ever be zero? No, because the point P is not the same as i. But you don't want to include things where the error is big at all in the sum. So basically, you're going to take one over this, but if the error is too small, I mean, is, is, if the error is too big, you don't want to include it at all. 
Uh, and once you decide what to include in the sum, then you take this weighted sum where the weight is inversely proportional to the error. And if you don't find any point, you know, by the time you've done this rule and this rule and looked in your R actuary and you don't find anything, then you're going to have to generate a new radiance cache irradiance cache value and store that. Now, I'm sort of assuming that as you generate these samples, you can figure out what color they are. You know, that might be from a pre-computed radiodicity solution. But if you don't want to do that, you have to take the secondary rays from here until eventually you hit a light source and get their contribution. Unless you're doing direct illumination. Probably you should do direct illumination for each of these anyway. But if you want indirect illumination for them, then you need to do different indirect illumination rays at a second level. And what Ward proposed is to put them in a separate cache, the second level ones, because you want to compute them differently. You don't need as many samples. You don't mind if there's a little noise here because it's actually being gathered anyway. So for the higher order samples, like, you know, say we were getting, all the lights were off and the only light was coming in through the hall, right? So as we gathered the primary rays, we have to get out into the hall in order we get any contribution. But we don't care whether the hall is as noisy, right? Because we're still getting it through that fairly large window or, you know, maybe not large compared to the solid angle of the room, but you know, if they're indirect rays, we don't care if they're as noisy because they're just part of an average. So you need fewer samples for them, and that's why he said they could be in a, in, in a different level that wasn't as strict as far as gathering the number of samples and worrying about the variance. So you have different caches at different levels of the ray bounce from your eye, each with a direct illumination calculation also, um, and that way when you do the, uh, the gathering, if one of these rays goes to a point where the secondary cache doesn't have enough information, then you continue. You know, and I forgot my point about going out the door. If we go out the door, some of those secondary rays for the wall outside the door are going to go to parts of the hall that we don't see. So it's useless to compute them at the high sample rate, low variance that we need for our initial image because we're never going to be shading them later. But once you have this irradiance cache, suppose you change your viewpoint. Well, you're probably going to see still a lot of the original cached values. So when I move this far, you know, I'm seeing a different part of the wall in the hall. So those pixels may actually need to be supplemented with more rays. But most of the values in the next frame will already be there from the current frame. So that's, you know, it's not entirely pre-computed like a radiosity solution that being directly used from a new viewpoint. But you can still make use of a lot of what you've done in the irradiance cache and just augment it with the extra information you need for the next frame. So that's the irradiance catching method. I guess my watch beeps, so that's all for today.